So today's message is an important one because it's going to show you what exactly you need to do to go to heaven. Who doesn't want to know that, right? The problem is, in the world today, even among those who call themselves Christians, there's a lot of different ideas about what it means to like, okay, I've done enough and now I'm confident that I know I'm going to go to heaven. And I'd probably make my own answer to this question a lot more complicated than what we're going to see Jesus teaches in a parable today. For some people, going to heaven means saying a special prayer. And as long as you say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sins, like you're golden. You just, somebody's got to lead you in the prayers. You repeat the words and then you've got your golden ticket. For others, it's loving how Jesus loved. And they say love is love and we just need to love the whole world. And so you get to decide what that love looks like often it just becomes a form of do-goodism. It's just being really kind, and as long as I do that, then I know that I'm going to heaven. For those who don't know what the Bible says at all, they have a picture of a cosmic scale that God has where all your good works are put on one side and all your bad works are put on the other side, and hopefully you've got more good to outweigh the bad, and that's how God decides what you deserve at the end of your life. And finally, I think many of you, hopefully, have been taught what the Bible teaches, but often we wonder if it's enough. And so they hear, maybe you've heard this introduction and you're thinking that I've got one more secret, like, well, if I just do that, then I can be assured of my salvation at the end. And spoiler, I'm not going to give you one more thing. Like the, the issue is it's so simple. It almost sounds too good to be true. It sounds like, Really, all I have to do is trust Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. There has to be something more than that. Really, there isn't. But for some reason, we're constantly trying to add to that and say, well, actually, you do have to do more if you want to be totally certain that you're going to go to heaven. So today, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 18. It's a parable where Jesus taught us uh, the simple and straightforward uh, or a simple and straightforward prayer of salvation. So if you want to open your Bibles there now, Luke chapter 18, we're going to be kicking off in verse 9. This is what it says. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told them this parable. So, I mean, he sets it up really straightforward, Luke, as he's writing this. He's saying, he's making it very, very clear who Jesus is trying to challenge. It's those who are confident in their own righteousness. In his day, there were the Pharisees. They knew the law of Moses so well. They knew it top to bottom, inside and out. They had a ton of it memorized and they devoted their lives to following it perfectly. In fact, to make sure that they would never come up and accidentally cross one of the boundaries of sin, they would double everything. You know, if it says that you're supposed to give 10% on your income, then they give 10% on everything that they grow in their garden. Like 10% of everything that they come in contact with. They are always going above and beyond to make sure that they did everything the most perfectly to honor God. In churches today, I think there's still people who were raised in the church who know all the right things to do and everything that they're supposed to say, who've been appointed to leadership positions on boards and who probably feel very secure that they're going to heaven because look at how important they are in their church. And it's to these people that Jesus is about to tell this parable. That's what Luke is saying when he says, to those who are confident in their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. There were two men who went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So he sets it up. Obviously, we're going to have a comparison between the righteous Pharisee and the despised tax collector. The Pharisee who knew how to honor God in every single way and the tax collector who was crooked and took advantage of people at every turn, or at least that's what the stereotype was. 
But anyone who'd read Luke's book up to this point, there'd already been several compare and contrast between the Pharisees and the tax collectors. And in each turn, Jesus would always surprise you and be like, "Eh, it's not who you think who's going to be doing this the right way. Actually, often it's the despised person who super who uh, goes beyond the expectation. And in this parable, it's going to be no different. Now, I don't think any of you who know what is in the Bible would ever count yourselves among the righteous like this, who would say that, you know, I look down on everyone else the way that this parable is being set up. But I do think that it's easy for us to forget if we've lived a long life as a Christian that at some point you were a mess too. You were far from God too and you needed salvation. It's often easy to, you know, when you're new to the faith to be like, man, I don't know anything. And you look at those who are farther ahead than you and maybe you felt judged at that point. But when you live the Christian life for a long time without thinking, you can fall into the shoes of the judgmental person who's looking down on others and thinking, man, I wish they'd get their life together. And so it's a a bit of a warning to all of us. Don't fall into this category. When people don't conform to what you expect for them, how they should dress, how they should speak, and how they should behave, it's really easy to get upset, and it's easy to look down on those people. And that's why we have this message today. That's why Paul, or not Paul, why Luke included it in his gospel, and it's why we're covering this today. It's to warn us, a reminder, to not become like the Pharisee in what he's about to pray. Verses 11 and 12, the profound prayer. This is not the model. You'll figure out why. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. Like you can just hear his smugness in that prayer. Oh, God, I'm so glad that I'm so much better than all these people. In fact, as I come into the sanctuary, I separate myself. I need not pray with them. Oh, 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 look at me. Oh, I'm sexually pure, faithful to my wife. I've never taken advantage of anybody like this guy over here. Like, you know, we read this and as I talk it up, you go, yeah, but we would never say that, right? Like we understand that'd be ridiculous. But I kind of wonder, somebody gave me that, if you don't like what I'm about to say, blame Mark Snook, okay? He gave me this idea, (laughs) but it was a good one. He said, look, if Jesus came today, he probably wouldn't, you know, in this example, say, I'm, I'm so glad that I'm not like the robbers, evildoers, and adulterers. But my, what might he say instead, you know, as an example that would challenge us a little more to our core? Maybe if Jesus came and used this parable of a model, what not to say, he'd say, God, I'm so grateful that I'm not like the alcoholics, the druggies, all those young people who can't get a job, can't keep a job just live off a mom and dad. So grateful I'm not like those single moms who are just hopping from guy to guy, sleeping with everyone in town. Or man, I'm glad I'm not like those gay and trans people who are trying to shove their politics down everyone's throat. Like we have these people groups in our minds and Christians, it's not like we're perfect here, that we hear about these and we're like, oh, glad I'm not like that. It's not the robbers and the evildoers, but we have the same level of comparison. We do it. And God's saying, don't be like that. Don't look at the outsiders, those who are very different than you, and just be like, oh, they're the worst. I'm so much better. I must please you so much more, God, because I'm not like them. That's what happens when you forget where you came from, that you too were once a sinner. And this is the exact attitude that we have to root out of our lives anytime that it begins to take root in our hearts. You can never become so callous 
about people on the fringes that you begin denigrating them in your thinking. Remember, it was Jesus who taught in Luke chapter 5, 31 and 32. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came for sinners. We should want sinners to be coming and hearing about Jesus. We should be excited when we're in the midst of sinners who are having the opportunity to hear about forgiveness and grace and mercy and love and acceptance. We don't want to be going and praying on our side of the sanctuary like, oh God, I'm so glad that I'm not like them. And I'm not quite sure what they're doing here. And honestly, I don't see much of that in this church, praise God. But I hear stories that it is, uh, it impacts a lot of churches in America. And that's not right. As Christians, we need to understand Jesus came for those people that maybe make you really uncomfortable. Then after putting others down, he puffs himself up. God, look at how stellar I am. Look at how amazing I am in worshiping you. I fast twice a week. How many of you fast twice a week? See, I'm better. And I give of a tenth of everything. So first he's got to smack other people down, and then he's got to puff himself up. And it, he's not wrong. He's doing a wonderful job following the law. He follows the law better than all of you. The problem is he's more concerned about the outside of his cup. Jesus in his famous woe passage in Matthew chapter 23 says, Woe to you Pharisees, you wash the outside of the cup, but the inside is full of your self-righteousness and your self-indulgence. And this is the perfect example. They care so much about what other people think. Other people hold them up and go, wow, that's a rock star follower of Jesus or follower of God. And meanwhile, Jesus looks on the heart and sees all this pride, all this arrogance, and is like, no, his heart has no love for anybody but himself. And then the most ironic thing about his prayer is what does he ask for? Nothing. All he says is, I'm better than all these people and look at how great I am. And like, that's the end of the prayer. Because he doesn't need anything from God. He's so set. He's got everything he needs in his own self-righteous. He doesn't need God to do anything for him. His salvation is earned on his own merit. And he feels great about that. Like I said, to be clear, this is not the profound prayer I'm holding up as a model here. This is not something that you should be looking to, to live out, you know. But we have to see it for what it is. It's a warning for what the world is trying to draw us towards. Satan wants you to look at other people's mistakes and feel superior to them. He wants you to see other people's sins and go, man, I don't know how they ever did that. I'm glad I have never thought of doing that. I have never cheated on my spouse. I've never even thought of that. I can't believe what a scumbag he is. And we get super judgmental. We get super self-righteous. And Satan's like, this is great because I'm going to get you to that place and then I'm going to lead you to your own temptation. So then you're going to feel terrible about yourself. And Satan's ruined a lot of people's lives that way because they get really self-righteous, they get really confidence in their own goodness. They feel like, I'm untouchable. I'd never do these terrible things these awful sinners are doing. And Satan's like, perfect. I got you right where I want you because now you have no need for Jesus in your life. And I'm going to bring you to the edge of temptation. You're going to fall. Okay. So we need to recognize we cannot take that path. When you start to hear yourself feeling superior to somebody, you need to knock it down and be like, I can't do that. That's not for me. Verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Where the Pharisee separated himself to, because he was so good. We've got this tax collector. He separates himself out on the other side because he feels so bad, so unworthy to even be in the sanctuary with others. He feels so ashamed 
of his actions, of all that he's done so remorseful. He can't even lift his eyes to heaven like others would have prayed. He just looks down at the ground and he beats his breast. We've got this picture of remorse, of just recognizing what he did was not good. It's a recognition he was not right with God. He knew he was in the wrong. And he didn't need the Pharisees' glare from across the room to tell him anything that he didn't already know about his own behavior. And then we've got this short prayer. Have mercy on me, a sinner. It's such a simple prayer, a compact prayer, but it's so full of meaning and life-changing power. First, mercy. He understands that his actions deserve punishment. When you're asking for mercy, you know that you've done wrong and you deserve something. Something's going to be coming to you. And you're like, please just have mercy. Just show me leniency here. I know I deserve what is coming my direction, but just be lenient, please. That's what he's asking for when he asks for mercy. Jesus, just forgive. Cover over this. You know, he... He's just asking that God would cover over his mess. That's what he's asking for with that mercy. Have mercy on me, a sinner. He clearly understands he's a sinner. He's in need of a Savior. He's the polar opposite of this Pharisee who is so perfect. He didn't need God. He didn't need to ask for anything from God. But this sinner recognizes that he has nothing to offer God. Instead, this tax collector is asking for everything. And he knows he deserves none of it. He hasn't earned anything. He is so far from God's moral perfection. He just stands in the corner with his head down, beating his breast. Have mercy on me, a sinner, God. I don't deserve anything from you. But I'm just laying myself out and hoping that you'll forgive. This is the profound prayer every single one of us needs to be willing to pray. It also holds several beliefs though in it that so many people are unwilling to admit. Nowadays, everyone wants to feel like they get to determine right from wrong. And so people like to be like, well, you're wrong for doing that. They're wrong for doing that. But then it's like, well, what are you wrong on? Well, I do everything right. Well, yeah, because you make your own standard. And so nobody feels like they're guilty anymore. So many people, like if you say, well, you've sinned, they're like, not really. I've done good. I try to be a good person. They don't even recognize this category of sinner. They don't see a need for a Savior. They don't, and if you don't have sin and you don't need a Savior, you don't need mercy. And this entire prayer makes no sense. Because people justify their own behaviors. Before we leave this point, I want to encourage you, each of you, remember that moment when you first asked God for mercy. Remember where you were at when you were down and out, when you knew that there was something between you and God and it needed to be made right. And it's because when we remember and we refocus that we were once like that miserable sinner, we're a lot more likely to show them grace. To say, we are so glad that you are here today. You may be dressed completely inappropriately. You may use words completely inappropriate to be in church. Your kids may be behaving in a way that is not how we normally see in church. And we still say, praise God, I'm glad you're here. Welcome to First Baptist. Because we have a message from God that we want you to hear. And we don't say, man, (laughs) you know what? Next time you come, make sure you wear something different. And you can't speak like, you know, we we lay all these rules on them and they haven't even yet been cleansed, washed, purified, and set free from their sinful nature. Does that make sense? We've got to see them the way Jesus sees them. So those are the prayers set up in this parable. One man, a model citizen for the community. The other, a despised outcast. One who lives his life seeking perfection. The other, fully admitting to all of his awful sinfulness. From the outside, we know how the world would clearly judge between these two guys. But Jesus is different. In verse 14, he concludes the parable. I tell you that this man, referring to the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. 
justified. So that's a word that means his standing before God when he gets to the throne room of God on his last day. There's not going to be a cosmic scale weighing your good and bad actions. There's going to be a giant book with names in it. And those who have put their faith in Jesus are going to have their name in that book of life. They are the ones who are justified. They are the ones who God's going to say, not guilty. They are the ones who, regardless of what you've done in your own life, good or bad, God looks down and He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ on you. He sees you holy and pure. That's what it means to be justified. The tax collector who at this point hadn't done anything good yet, but just had a heart of remorse. Jesus is saying he's the one who God is going to say, not guilty. You're righteous. You're pure. Welcome into my kingdom. That's what God sees. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 explains this a little bit. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. This is known as the great exchange. We're sinners. We still sin. Even after we come to faith, we still sin. Jesus, who never sinned, became sin for us, so that all sin for all time, every sin you have ever committed and will ever commit, has already been nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. And the exchange, he takes all your garbage and he gives you his perfection. And you didn't do anything to earn it. That is incredible. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus. That's why you're no longer a sinner, but you're a sinner saved by grace. And even better than that, you're now a child of God. You have the inheritance. When Jesus died on the cross, it was for all your sins. So when you do like the tax collector and you humbly seek God's mercy, you receive that mercy from God and you cling to it. It doesn't come and go based on each day, each new sin. His mercy covers it all. The exchange is made once and for all. Now, if you've never prayed this prayer, if you've never said, God, I need your mercy, I encourage you, don't let today finish without praying that prayer. There's no special words. You'll, I'll pray it later. You can join me if that's what you want. If in your heart you say, you know, this is true. I am a sinner. I am a mess and I need mercy. Don't let today go by without receiving that. Because that's the only way that you can know for certain where you're going to be after you breathe your last. So, what's Jesus' main point in this entire passage? It's ultimately on the upside-down nature of the kingdom. He ends with, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. As he says in other places, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Jesus has this upside-down turning of how the world sees things. And he's like, where people think, I'm great, he's like, no, 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 I don't care how the world sees you. I see the heart, and I want to see humility. I want to see love. I want to see people who aren't elevating themselves and saying, I'm so glad I'm better than those people. They're the worst. That's not for Christians. We should see people who are sinners in need of God's saving. And rather than being like, I just, I had that experience yesterday. I'm going to admit my own fault. I saw a guy on a moped with the big flag driving to work. My first thought was, oh, he's got a DUI. I bet he doesn't have his license. And right away, I thought about this sermon that was coming up. And I'm like, oh, you know what I mean? Just that quick self right. Oh, that guy's got a DUI. He's got to ride a moped to work. That's not how we should look at these situations, though. We can't be like that. That's what the world sees. And they're like, I don't want to be like the Christians. Christians need to be like Jesus and be the ones that say, we recognize we were there. We were sinners. We've received God's mercy and we simply want that for you as well. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. We need to stop becoming so prideful and thinking we're better than others. When we feel that way, like I did yesterday, we have to quickly be like, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? We remind ourselves we're no 
better. Quick aside. Also, let's not puff up other leaders. I've seen this in the mega church movement. There's all these pastors who are so puffed up, they think they're amazing, and then we're watching them all fall. We need to not be treating other people like they're royalty. You guys do a great job of not treating me like royalty. Keep it up. Okay? I don't ever want to feel like, man, I can do no wrong up here. Like, that's when people stumble. That's when Satan's like, this is great. We all need to remember, we are sinners saved by grace. So we all begin our lives as sinners, and hopefully by God's grace, we all find the path to mercy and forgiveness. But not everybody's found that path yet. And so may we never become so proud and so far removed from our moment of salvation that like the Pharisees, we look down on others. Rather than dismissing them, may we pray for them, may we hope for better for them, and may God respond. While their sin may be many, His mercy is more. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray?